Chapter 7 Good News and Bad News After school, Bat and Mom were sitting at the kitchen table having a snack of sliced apples and cheddar cheese, waiting for Janie to get home. Bat liked to stack two slices of apple with one piece of cheese in between. It made for the perfect ratio of crunchiness and mushy saltiness. The was into the sling around Bat's neck, but the little guy was rustling around more than usual, making the stacking procedure difficult. He's getting bigger, Mom said. He's not quite a baby anymore. He's more like a toddler, and toddlers have lots of energy. What did you do with me when I was a toddler? Bat asked. I made sure you got lots of exercise so you'd sleep at night, Mom answered. Bat thought about this as he bit into his slightly crooked apple cheese apple sandwich. Thor needed more exercise, and, and, his, and as his caretaker, Bat's job was to make sure that that happened. <clears throat> Maybe I'll build an obstacle course, Bat said, thinking out loud. The front door slammed open, and Bat heard the stomping of two sets of feet coming down the hallway toward the kitchen. Janie and Ezra... He could tell it was them by the sound of their stomping. Janie's run was sort of a skip-hop sound, short, quick steps close together. Ezra's was louder and more regular, and right behind Janie's. Guess what? Janie yelled, bursting into the kitchen. Her cheeks were bright red from running, and her hair, which had been curly that morning, hung in limp ringlets around her face. You got the part of the Queen and Alice in Wonderland, Bat said? Bat? Janie whined. You ruined my news. You said to guess, Bat said. It was just an expression, said Ezra. He reached out and took a, an apple slice off of Blatt's plate, without even asking first. Bat pulled his plate a little closer. Hi, Dr. Tam, Ezra said. Hello, Ezra, said Mom. And then to Janie, honey, that is wonderful news. Congratulations. Thanks, said Janie shrugging out of her backpack and letting it drop to the floor by the back door. I am so excited. Rehearsals start tomorrow after school. Tomorrow, said Mom, but tomorrow is Tuesday. We have rehearsal after school every day for the next three weeks, Janie said. Oh, Mom said. Well, that throws a monkey wrench in our schedule. Bat knew that Mom was using an expression and that there wasn't really a wrench shaped like a monkey but it felt satisfying when he imagined one anyways. Usually you take care of Bat Tuesdays and Thursdays until I get home, Mom said. You're not going to tell me I can't do the play, are you? Janie's voice was getting louder and higher, like the tea kettle and was just about to boil, because that would be totally unfair. No, no, of course not, Mom said. We'll work something out. Then she stood up and hugged Janie. I'm so proud of you, she said. Be sure to call your dad and tell him the good news. He'll be thrilled. Now, Ezra, would you like an apple of your own? Ezra, whose hand, who had been reaching out towards Bat's plate again, said, sure, Dr. Tam, and some G's, too. Later that day, after Ezra had gone home after dinner and dishes and Thor's bedtime feeding, when Bat was brushing his teeth, Mom came into the bathroom and sat down on the edge of the bathtub. Bat, she said, I want to ask you a question. Bat hated it when people talked to him when he couldn't answer. Worst of all was at the dentist when he had his hand in his mouth. When he had his mouth wide open, the desk of rubber glove hands were in his mouth. And she'd ask, so Bat, what grade are you in? Or what's your favorite hobby these days, Bat? And there was no way he could answer without biting her fingers. Right now, there weren't any fingers in his mouth, but there was a cheek full of foamy toothpaste. Bat spat it out and rinsed his mouth and then said, what? Your sister's going to be busy on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next few weeks, Mom said. And so we're going to have to change our schedule. I know, said Bat. We're going to have to come home earlier. Well, no, Mom said. I can't do that. Then I can come to the clinic, Bat said. I could help Lawrence. It's nice to have you at the clinic now and then, Mom said. But maybe not quite that much. Also, you'll have your spring project to be working on. And then she told Bat that she talked to Israel's dad and that he had said that Bat could come over to their house for a few hours after school on Tuesdays and Thursdays until Janie's play was over. You could ride home with them. 
They give you a snack and you and Israel could work on your project. How does that sound? It sounded great for exactly three seconds until Bat remembered Thor. Can I bring Thor with me, Bat asked. Oh, Bat, Mom answered. I think that would be too much to ask of Israel's dad. Thor will have to stay with me at the clinic and Lawrence will take care of him. That sounds like a terrible idea, Bat said. Tell Janie she can't do the play. Bat, Mom said, that doesn't seem fair, does it? And it's just for a couple hours, only on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and only for a few weeks. We can do this, Bat, can't we? Bat thrust his toothpaste, brushed back into the holder, and wiped his mouth with the hand towel. He remembered something Mom sometimes said to him and turned to her. Just because we can do something, he said, doesn't mean we should. Chapter 8 Kitchens there were some terrible things about Bat's new after-school schedule. The extra time away from Thor, number one. Number two, the uncomfortable feeling of going to a new place, itch itching Bat like the heat rash he sometimes got on the summer's hottest day. The inconvenience of being away from his very own home, his perfectly comfortable room. But Bat had to admit the next afternoon, staring up at Israel's dad's massive, rumbling black truck. The ride wasn't one of them. Bat had never been in such an interesting vehicle. Mom drove a perfectly average station wagon, and Dad had an uncomfortably tight sports car with a hump in the middle of the back instead of a seat. Israel's dad's truck was totally different. It was like seeing a Great Dane after a lifetime of chihuahuas. It was the ostrich of the car world, impressively large. Tuesday's school day had ended, and when Bat and Israel walked out of the building to the pickup line, Bat immediately spotted the truck. I think that's the coolest truck I've ever seen, Bat said to Israel. I didn't know you cared about trucks, Israel said. Neither did I, said Bat. Hi, boys, said Israel's dad through the open window as he pulled up to the front of the line. He leaned over and unlocked the passenger side door. Hop in. The truck was so tall that Bat had to use the chrome bar that ran beneath the door to step up and climb in. Standing on the bar, peering into the cab of the truck, Bat found himself at a loss of words. It had never occurred to him, to Bat, to care the least bit about a vehicle. He liked fur and feathers and scales, teeth and claws and tails. The truck was just chrome and paint and rubber and steel, but somehow it felt alive. Peering into the cab was like looking into the heart of a dragon. I like your truck, Mr. Zimmerman, Bat said. Thank you, Bat, he answered. Call me Tom. Tom, Bat said, half to himself, as Israel's dad pulled forward the front passenger seat so that the boys could climb onto the narrow rear bench. It had, Bat noticed with satisfaction, three seat belts. He plopped himself happily in the center seat, latching his belt, and said to Tom, Tell me everything about this truck. By the time they pulled into Israel's driveway 10 minutes later, Bat knew the difference between a V8 and a V6 engine. He knew what a drive tail drive train was and why it was better to have four-wheel drive than two-wheel drive. He knew that Tom's truck could tow up to 12,000 pounds, give or take a few, Tom said. And he knew with 99% surety, because that was as sure as you could be about anything, that one day he would drive a truck exactly like Israel's dad. Tom put the car in park and turned it off. Here we are, he said, which normally would have prompted Bat to say something about how that was kind, the kind of statement that really didn't mean anything, because it's always true. You could always say, here we are, no matter where you were, and you'd be right, but Bat didn't point that out this time. Thank you for driving us, he said instead, remembering his manners like Mom had told him to try to do. Any time, Tom answered. And then he said, you're a cool kid, Bat. That was definitely the first time anyone had ever called Bat cool. Bat followed Israel into the house, putting his backpack on the, on the kitchen counter next to where Israel set his. Bat looked around as Israel slammed open the pantry and rustled through it looking for a snack. It was a very different kitchen than the two kitchens Bat was most used to. His kitchen at home had mostly empty countertops, tiled in plain white squares. There was a bowl of fruit, 
and a toaster. And that was about it. Everything else, Mom, kept put away, as she said. Habit from keeping a clean operating room. The kitchen at Dad's apartment was pretty empty, too, but for a different reason. He had only lived in the apartment for a year and a half, and he didn't really have much stuff. Israel's kitchen would have made a terrible operating room. The countertops were blue, but it was hard to tell under all the stacks of colorful ceramic bowls and cups and plates that were piled all over them. The walls were light yellow, but it was hard to tell under the pictures that were hanging. Some framed, some loose taped up sketches all over them. Israel emerged from the pantry with a bag of pistachio nuts, a box of cereal, and a chocolate bar. Do you want a snack, he asked to bat, the first words he's spoken since they left school, or do you just want to hang out with my dad some more? The chocolate bar looked delicious. Snack, please, bat said. Chapter 9. Bowls. Bat had never eaten a bowl of cereal without milk before, but Israel poured a half box into a big gray and pink bowl, and they then poured a bunch of pistachios into a slightly smaller greener bowl with swirly blue curlicues all over it. Then he put away the cereal box and the bag of pistachios, told Bat grab the chocolate bar and headed into the backyard. Bat, chocolate bar in hand, followed him. Wow, he said, standing in the doorway, looking into the yard. Israel was placing the two fancy bowls full of snacks on the table underneath a big shade tree. But that was the least interesting thing happening in the yard. Bat counted 11 pinwheel spinners planted in the garden beds all around the yard. Some had a bit of colored glass suspended in webs of metal. Other were all metal, but a mix of copper and silver. Big, bright glass orbs were tucked everywhere, glints of shiny color under the tree, lining the path through the yard that ended at a garden shed. The shade tree's branch were heavily with stained glass ornaments and wind chimes that filled the air with silverly tinkles and deep, vibrating clangs. There was so much to see and hear that Bout felt caught between it all, the colors, the sounds, the newness of everything. Suddenly, despite the beauty and excitement of Israel's amazing backyard, Bat wished desperately that he were home. Hey, Israel said. Are you okay? Bat felt himself bouncing on the balls of his feet, and he knew his eyes were full of tears. He still clenched the chocolate bar in his hand. Sort of not really, he said. Israel scratched his head. Come on, he said, taking the chocolate bar from Bat and setting it on the table. I'll introduce you to my mom. But instead of leading Bat into the house, Israel walked through the garden to the shed. As they crossed the yard, Bat took deep, calming breaths and wiped his eyes. The shed door was open, and as he got closer, Bat saw that it wasn't just a place to store shovels and rakes. Hey, Mom, said Israel. You're home, came a voice from inside the shed. Is your friend with you? Yup, said Israel. Bat, come say hi to my mom. Bat peered into the shed. Israel's mom was in there, surrounded by shelves full of bowls and cups and plates and pots, some glazed in bright colors, others the flat gray of unfinished clay. She was sitting behind a potter's wheel, a lump of wet clay in her hand. Splatters of clay decorated her arms and her overalls. Hi, Bat, she said. I'm Cora. Hi. Hello, said Bat. What are you doing? I'm making a bowl, Cora said. Do you want to try? Bat shook his head. I don't like slimy things, he said, or sticky things. He looked around at all the shelves and all the things upon them. Did you make all this stuff? Most of it, Cora said. Over there is Israel's work. The shelf she pointed to was filled with lumps of clay that looked a lot like the lump of clay Israel had made for Bat, which Bat had right then tucked into his pocket of his vest. Mom's stuff is better than mine, Israel said. She's a professional artist. I'm just starting out. Bat looked back and forth between the pottery Cora had made and the awkward lumps Israel made. Yes, he said. Your mom's stuff is way better. Israel crossed his arms across his chest. Bat felt his stomach rumble and said, I think I'm ready for that snack now.